Business Connections Live, the UK's leading online business channel. Business Connections Live with Steve Highland. Hello there, welcome along. This is Business Connections Live, the program for entrepreneurs, SMEs and business owners. Now, on today's show, we're going to be talking about creating a profitable business. I mean, it's something that we all think and dream perhaps about. But today, we're going to actually be looking at maybe some of the trials and tribulations that you come across when you are signing up a business. What are the kind of obstacles that you're going to come up against and how do you get around those obstacles? And maybe what's the inspiration that you have? What's the thing that's, that's making you step back for a moment and go, right, I am going to start my own business and I am going to move forward. I'm going to do something with my life. Joining me in the studio today is Claire Brumby. She He's a coach, mentor, speaker, and consultant. Lovely to have you with us today, Claire. Thank you for inviting me along. No, it's really nice. It's, it's really nice. Now, if, for those people that don't know anything about you, you are the author. I'm going to pick the book up. Yes, you are the author do. of uh, this book here. It's called The Winning Mix. Yes. Yep. And what it is, it's a story that you had about starting a food business. It is. So tell us a little bit about the background to that. Why why, why the book? Why the food business? Okay, right. Okay. So, so it's it's, as you've said, it's called the winning mix, and each chapter is divided into two, three sections. So at the beginning bit of each chapter, it's my story of how I launched a food business with my husband, and the second bit of each chapter is um, the the how-to aspect of it. So I've broken down how to launch a food business into eight steps, and then at the end of each chapter, you've got in there um, what would Claire do now. So looking back with the hindsight, <laughs> and now I know the steps. What would you do now? Yeah, None yeah. of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I absolutely would. Um, and there's and so obviously and then. And the sprinkled throughout it, you've got, um, oh, as if by chance, there, the diamonds, which are my nuggets of advice and, and key takeaways and things like that. And then at the back of the book, we've got all the um, acronyms within the industry that you know nothing about when you first start up. And also, you know, top tips of how to exhibit at, at trade shows, um, how to pitch to buyers, and also a little bit in there about how to never give up as an entrepreneur, because we, we face that daily. So. What, what I don't want people to be thinking is that this is just about launching a food business, because really, I, I've, having read the book, I, it, it comes over to me that really the trials and tribulations, I keep using those words, the, the issues that you come up with are actually applicable to nearly every business Absolutely. and every startup. Yeah, but... And I think that's what makes the book so valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, the inspiration behind the book, though, you weren't very well. I mean, we've been yep. there, and it seems yep. that a lot of people who do uh, speaking or are entrepreneurial seem to have a, a moment in their lives that is, is life-changing. It's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call. What, what happened to you? So, so I so back in two thousand and five, um, I I literally had had severe chest pains one day. Thought I was having a heart attack. Um, turned out it wasn't a heart attack. I went to my doctor's and he said there's a high you know a high chance that it's a pulmonary embolism. So not a heart attack. Worse than that, then. Yeah, yeah, you're going to die. <laughs> you could possibly die. Yes. Let's get you to hospital. So um, he was absolutely bang on, got to the hospital, and they were taking blood from my, my wrist veins um, to try and um, see how fast the blood was clotting, um, which gives them um, um, an idea of if it is a, a PE, pulmonary embolism or not. And sure enough, he was right. So um, I was in hospital in total for about 10 days, having tests and scans and, and, and everything. And yeah, it was. It was pulmonary embolism, uh, which is blood clot on your lung. And I I'm a lucky survivor of that. So that was my wake up call. That was like, do you know, you're not here forever. Um, so what was the what was the train of thought when you were lying there? You you go back and that happens to you. You're you're in hospital. You, it, it, if if you don't mind me saying, it's not the kind of thing. I think I'll start a crisp company then. Yeah, no, no, no that, that wasn't. So so what was going through my mind first and foremost is I want to stay alive. I've got three children at the time. They were one, four, and seven. So what was going through my mind is live don't die that mm. that was the first thing and then through my mind i went through all the times when my kids would need me um the girls were four and seven so i was going in my mind about them growing up and and at what stages you need your mum um and then george with him only being 13 months he would never have even remembered me mm -hmm. so the the thing that was absolutely in my mind nothing else was in my mind other than staying alive and being there for the kids to grow up 
Um, I only had my awakening of what I wanted to do. What were you doing at the time as a career? I mean, obviously, with three children, you must have been a full-time mum, I would imagine. No, no, no. I was working as a hotel manager, managing a hotel and a, and a, and a spa. So I've always worked full-time. So the kids have always come along with me and I've always, you know, worked throughout, mm. well, even through... Yeah, they've had, I've had the kids and gone straight back to work, literally within days. Um, so, yeah, I've always had um, kind of high, high stressful, you know, jobs and things. So, um, yes, yeah, so, so my, my, I was just stay alive, that was it. Nothing else mattered. Um, and then my, my gradual awakening, uh, which is what I say in my book, I was, you know, some people have these um, eureka moments where they, they suddenly get, oh, and I'm going to do that. That never happened for me. It was just like, I know... I need to do something now with this with this awakening that I've got. But what what can I do? Um, and that came from eating myself well because I was on a whole manner of different drugs and things to keep my blood flowing and, and keep healthy. But my body didn't like those, so my hair was falling out and um, I had severe joint aches and, and pains. So I started to research how to get off the medication, which clearly wasn't working for my body. Mm. Um, and that's when they're so from from a near-death situation here to a crisp business, that's kind of how it how it happened, really. Um, <laughs> from zero to crisps. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know that, that, that kind of a, a little bit derogatory, but, I mean, the thing was you went through a whole series of processes. First of all, let's, let's look at the whole identifying of what you were going to do. And mm -hmm. you're, you're looking at the healthy eating. A lot of people, when you talk to them about sales, they, they say they've fallen into it. Do you think you've fallen into the entrepreneurialism that you started doing something there was a need within your personal life and so what you did you developed on the need and all of a sudden the business arrived nearly unexpectedly it, it did I, I've always been an entrepreneurial person um, I remember being I don't know I think I'd maybe about eight or nine and we had a really bad winter um, and most kids were sat inside thinking yeah we're snowed in well I went drive clearing and got paid like a fiver per drive and now you know, I'm 45, so when I was eight, you do the maths at how, <laughs> how much a five it was worth. Yeah, it yeah. was a lot of money. So I was like, yeah, hey, I'm coining it in, you know. So, and I've, you know, my parents have been entrepreneur, are entrepreneurial, so I think that's always been in me to always have do, that Do you drive. think then that, that, I mean, we were talking outside before we came into the studio the other day, that do you, do you think society is nearly split in a certain way where you have people who are, you, you've got the entrepreneurials, who are there that go out there, they start up the business, mm -hmm. they're the people that um, c will, will create the jobs and then you have the people who have to work for people. So they are the workers. Do, do you th and there's never the two will meet. Well, I think it's wired into you. I think you are what you are. And, and actually you can try and, and detour from that because, you know, let, let's face it, and I think we'll all be honest, you know, sometimes it gets really, really tough and you think, you know, why am I doing this? What am I doing? But I think if it's something that's inherently wired in you, you it can be a blessing and a curse. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes you would think, oh, OK, you know, I, I would like an easier life and I would like to not feel as challenged. But I think it's... It, it's um, you like that adrenaline, even mm. though sometimes you don't want the adrenaline. So I think, yeah, I think you're wired that way. I think. When, when you look back, what do you think the, uh, and this is interesting, from an entrepreneurial point of view, and from starting a business and everything you've learned, what do you think the, the biggest life lesson or maybe the biggest business lesson has been for you? I think it's to keep going. I think it's to have that persistence and that, um, that, that drive and to keep going. I think it's to understand people as well, because at the core of anything are people. Do you know what I mean? And, and I think if you can relate to people, I think that that's, um, that's a big thing. What about the biggest personal skill then that, that you think you might have learned and grown and, and gained from, from the experience of starting the business? What would the, the biggest personal skill be? I think I've learned a lot about myself and I think I've learned to, like I say, apply that tenacity and that determination. And I think, you know, by, by working to that, you then inspire people. Um, so I think that's you know what I what I do now with my clients and who I work with and who I mentor. I think that's what they take from that. I think they you know it's a bit of like oh well if Claire can get get up against the tough times then I can as well. So I think it's to to be able to inspire people and to be able to um, keep them going with their drive as well. There's going to be people watching the program today and they're going to be sort of saying to themselves that I've got an idea in my head. I think I'm entrepreneurial. I I think I want to start a business. What what would what would be your advice to actually to the start up the actual get go so they haven't got they haven't raised the money they've kind of got the idea of what their product's going mm -hmm. to be they think they've found a purpose for it what would be your advice to the the the, the fledgling entrepreneur that's out there to research really I think to research I think you need to marry the research that you're going to do up with your own drive and determination so if it's something that you really really want to do um, you're going to do it anyway 
I think if you're that if you're that kind of person, nobody's going to talk you out of it. But what I would say is to do the research thoroughly and know exactly what you're getting into, both in your marketplace, both into the um, category of whatever that business. Is. So if it's food, um, it's to research the category, it's to research what's going on out there, it's to research the the trends, what's happening, um, but also to know yourself, really, really understand and know yourself and where what what skills have you got and what do you need to reach out for. So do you like manufacturing better than you like um, doing the sales and the marketing? Um, do you like doing you know there's, there's different things within every single business and it, it's knowing knowing yourself and knowing what you can where your skill set lies we, we often talk to people here who are entrepreneurial in the startup but aren't particularly good at long-term running a mm -hmm. business so they're they're very good at raising the money they're very good at coming up with the ideas but actually absolutely hopeless at running a business long term yep. do you, when you are mentoring people do you sometimes see that and you think actually you'd be better off selling the business and starting something else well or bringing the skills in so it part of part of what I do when we do sit down and look at their whole business um, is to look at you know what what is it when, when you when you start up you have to wear all the hats um, and that that's something you just gonna have to get your head but around. when you move on then you've got to delegate that information yes. and it's all yeah. about time management delegation and it's knowing and the do right you find time. that difficult um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm. You're not, awful, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you just knew that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I am. Um, yeah, I'm not the most. I, I'm organised in my own way. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> hey, the truth's coming out now. Uh, my guest today's show is Claire Brumby. It's a fascinating insight into this. If you are entrepreneurial and you're thinking to yourself, actually, this, this is you know, the kind of thing that I'm going through. Maybe you've had that moment in your life as well where you've, you've stood back for a moment and you thought to yourself, actually, my life is about to change and things are going to be different from now on. Well, then this show is all for you today. My guest on today's show is Claire Brumby. She's a coach, mentor, speaker and a consultant. And you're watching Business Connections Live. Well, as always, it's great to have your company. Hope you're enjoying the guest. That was really nice, actually. It was a lovely bit of television, actually, to see, to see that just for a, a few seconds there. Uh, I hope you're going to enjoy the rest of the show because we are going to take you through, uh, really, the, the, the journey that Claire went through when it came to actually starting her business. And I think you're going to find it a real insight. Let's go back a week now, shall we? We talked to Dominic Renshaw last week on the program. We were talking about Google AdWords and Google Ads. He is a Google Ads Word expert. He came in. He was telling us really what we need to consider. He's been doing the job for a long, long time actually and there were some realizations as I was talking to him I thought it's a really interesting program uh, if you've been thinking about using Google AdWords because we talk a lot of time about generically setting up the SEO on our website and driving traffic that way but can you buy an audience and bring them in as long as the website is right and as long as the product is right will Google Google not easy for me to say will Google AdWords actually really work for you it was a great show last week if you did miss the live show you can always catch up if you go to our website website at businessconnectionslive.com but just to give you a bit of a tease here's Dominic Renshaw on last week's edition of Business Connections Live. Uh, my guest on today's show is Dominic Renshaw. He's a Google AdWords expert. He also has a company as well called adextra.com. Now we all know the web is overtaking the world. Let's be honest, how many times you spend on your mobile phone on a daily mm -hmm. basis just looking at it? It's crazy. That is where marketing has changed over the years and where it's essential to be in that marketplace. Somebody will go, for example, on Google and see an ad. They'll click the ad. They'll then go on to Facebook. Strangely enough, the ad will flash up again. They'll then go on to a different platform and see the ad again. By the third or fourth time, they're now involved. Basically, what Google's trying to do, with it, whether it's ads or whether it's just the normal listing, they're trying to get the most relevant thing at the top. Because the logic being for Google is that if you get the relevant thing at the top, you'll click that, you'll want to use Google again. Um, but what they're doing is, uh, their business is their platform. Now, if you want to use their platform to promote your goods, which in essence you do because it's the largest search engine in the world, then you naturally have to pay for that. You've got to understand what keywords you want for your business. Take another step back, what is it you really want to advertise for your business? Take another step back, what is your website saying in your business? Then you've got your website sorted. Get yourself your landing pages, your most important pages with a sales funnel in place so you can then convert these customers you're about to bring to your website. The old style was just one keyword, plumber, for example. Plumber. Plumber. That was it, bang. That's yep. what you, keywords used to be. However, it's changed considerably and this is a lot to do with voice search now. 
this sounds a bit strange, but all your Google Home and your Amazon Echo and everything else out there, people are now talking to their devices. Even to your mobile phone, you will talk and you will say, I need an emergency plumber in Reading. That was no longer a small word, it's now a sentence. They're called long tail keywords. People assume when you set up a Google AdWords campaign, it's similar to the old paper campaign. You've got an advert, it's out there, it's done, it's not. A typical campaign, let's just rewind slightly, will have around 1,800 ads in it, ballpark figure. That's just a standard. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of different ads out there with a lot of different keywords. Mm -hmm. Some keywords are good, some ads are good. But until you start looking at what's coming back, you cannot decide which one's which. There is no point in saying that will work and that will work or that won't work and that won't work until it's out there. Let the public decide what works for you. Otherwise, you might be missing a trick. Our biggest job before we start any work with any company is understanding what they want it to do. Without that knowledge, there's no point. So if any Google AdWords expert or any SEO expert or any of those come to you and say, yeah, we can do this for you, if they're not taking the time to understand your business, steer clear them. How many times does your website change? How many times are you actually updated? That's your window to the world and people don't look at their own website and change it on a regular basis. It's scary to think that that is their shop windows of the world and they don't do anything with it. To start off, if you're a small business, let's take back to a one-man business, somebody's quite small, then they should be spending anywhere from 100 to 300 pounds a month on the advertising side of the coin. Anything less than 100, there's not enough clicks coming through to make it worth it. Um, but you also want to make sure it's getting working within your 100 to 300 pound budget before you then start increasing it. That's a small business. Slightly larger businesses, let's say for example a good size SME, then you're looking at probably £1,000 a month to £2,000, maybe £4,000, that sort of neck of the woods. Get it working and then increase the budget. The way it works is something called ad rank. Now ad rank is to how much you spend per keyword multiplied by the quality score. Now, how do you get what's quality score? Quality score is what the keyword is, does the ad relate to that keyword, as in have I got the same text in it, and does your landing page relate to the ad? One, two, three. Now, you can be in position one, paying less than the guy in position two. You're gonna think, what? How, do, how on earth does that work? Mm -hmm. If you're more relevant to what Google wants, you will pay less than the guy next to you who's slightly less relevant, so their quality score is less. Dominic Renshaw, owner of adextra.com limited. Uh, we are a Google advertising company. Basically, takeaways for you guys, keywords. Keywords are the most important thing of any campaign you ever do. Have a research, use something called Google AdWords Keyword Planner. Just type in Google, you'll find it. Research keywords you want, look at which ones are the biggest traffic and go for the ones below those. Those are the ones that are gonna be cheaper for you. The second one is, I told you about quality score. Make sure your keywords relate to your ads, relate to your website, whether that be a landing page or the general. That is absolutely critical. If you get those three things in place, you'll be 99% of the way there. There are two things I'm gonna tell you that are the best thing to take away. So keywords, and make sure your quality score is good. Keyword, ads, landing page. Dominic Renshaw, fantastic show. If you get an opportunity, do go to the website. By the way, if you're enjoying this program, there are over 300 hours of great business advice for you if you go to our website. And if you'd like a program similar to it, then you can also do that as well. The website, of course, is businessconnectionslive.com. If you'd like to be on the show, you'd like to find out how to be on the show, then you can also drop us an email, if you wish, to studio at businessconnectionslive.com. Or if you wish, why don't you pick the phone up? That's the biggest problem I think a lot of business owners have today. We don't pick the phone up enough. 01784 256 777 is our telephone number. You can follow our stream of consciousness. You may well be watching this on Twitter at the moment. If you are, then press it a few times. Give us a bit of love, a few hearts there, if you don't mind. Thank you very much indeed. You can also go to our Facebook page. You may have noticed there's been a bit of a change on the Facebook page, the way we're approaching that. Then go along to that. Or, of course, as we've already said, you can go straight along to our website where there are all those different programs uh, the one that I, I'm getting a lot of response to at the moment is uh, the one we did on pricing a couple of weeks back. That's a really interesting show. Just go along to businessconnectionslive.com.
You're watching Business Connections Live uh, in the studio today is Claire Brumby. She's a coach, mentor and speaker. She also does consultancy as well. She's doing all sorts of different things. She started up a business. If you're not familiar with the business, the business was, is... So my business right now is Claire Brumby and I'm the food guide and the business that I founded with my husband, which was a food brand, is Scrubbies Vegetable Crisps. Although I think now the new owners are just Scrubbies because they've extended the range. So they've got, um, I don't know, 40 or 50 different SKUs, um, single units. That, that must be a very exciting <coughs> to, to be able to start a business from nothing. So it's just an idea. Mm -hmm. And then to, maybe now you feel, you walk into the shop and you actually see the brand that you conceived sitting there yeah. and now you've your hands off now. That yeah. must be a little frustrating, is it at times? It, it's, it, do you know what? It, it's lovely though, because I know, it's, and again in my book, at the beginning of the book, I say to people who are launching their, their food brand, um, when I, so I say to the reader, when you see food brands on the shelf, particularly challenger brands, there's a story behind it. So there's a story about the product, why it came to be. There's the founder's story and everything. So that's what's exciting about challenger brands on the shelf. There's a story. And when I see my brand on the shelf now, uh, and people send me photographs. I got a photograph the other day. Someone was saying that, oh, you know, I still see them out and about. And there's like, you know, a massive range. No, I just feel proud. Mm. I feel really, really proud because I know what went into it. I know... Um, I know the thought process, I know the, the blood, sweat and tears, I know how hard it was at the coalface and for that brand to be out there thriving and growing now, it just makes me feel immensely proud really. Well let's let's go back to pre-success then. Um, somebody once said on this program that most com uh, companies or, or entrepreneurs suffer from obscurity. Nobody knows you're there. It's all a big secret and even if you don't want it to be a big secret, invariably it is. People will talk about this program. They go, why didn't I know this program was mm -hmm. here? Because you're working all the time and I think life and business is very si silo driven. For instance, even if you look at the different networking organisations that are out there, you, you hear about maybe for networking there will be people listening they've never heard of for networking mm -hmm. uh, you think of BNI people may have heard of BNI and all the different networking events and yeah. people are stars within those different vertical silos yeah. so how do you get the message out there how do you how do you start doing that marketing how do you get people to know your brand so the way we did it was through, uh, I'm a big fan of guerrilla marketing, which they, that, that just means like a whole lot of effort and different ideas and things put on in at a low budget. So, um, so the, the, the biggest kind of like wins that guerrilla marketing gave me, I would say, um, was getting Chris Evans with a packet of scrubbies in his mouth and clearing... Which sounds vaguely rude, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get me giggling again, and <laughs> shush. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, yeah so, so how that happened was we were at, um, so Chris Evans is the is the founder of Carfest and he launched the Carfest festivals I think it was in 2012 mm -hmm. and uh, you have to apply at that time you had to apply to go in the Britain's Best Pavilion which we did so we just launched in May 2012 after we'd had years of trying to even get to that stage pitching for finance which is actually one of the biggest challenges I think I think new food businesses come up two major challenges one is getting the finance to start and two do they look for a manufacturer or do they um, manufacture themselves so they're, they're two challenges but anyway so we were pitching to get investment to launch for a long long time and then we eventually got it part of the reason we couldn't get the the funding was because we were sort of ahead of the time in terms of where the the healthy snacking category was going so right now you can go into any supermarket any petrol forecourt any 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 store really and you'll see a healthy snacking category i mean your, yours were vegetable crisps yes they, they were they? yeah so, so they as, were like potato crisps yes they were and the, the reason they were healthier is because they were lower fat and lower calorie and and we achieved that by the uh, manufacturing process. Um, so at the time when we were um, looking at how we were going to do this, there were three different methods open to us. So it was a vacuum frying method, or it was a baking method, or it was a dehydration method. So we settled on the, the vacuum frying, which is how we got the lower fat and the lower calorie, but it also retained a lot of the vitamins and minerals, and there was no acrylamides in there as well. So from a health aspect of where I'd come from to uh, you know to, to form the business, um, everything everything all the um, credentials were there with that. Um, so we eventually got the funding to start. Um, so then how do we make a noise? How do we get the brand out there is what you were asking. Um, so I, I did the guerrilla marketing because we, we launched on really no budget at all. Um, and so you have to be loud and you have to get out there and be a positive um, disruptive influence. And that 
nugget of advice was given to me actually um, by Wilfred Emmanuel Jones. Who's so what did you do that was disruptive then within your marketplace? What were you doing? Um, so, so like I say, the uh, so we were disrupting the fact that we brought a healthier vegetable crisp market, didn't exist until we, we came up. At the time when we launched we were the only independent um, UK vegetable crisp company, so that was quite quite disruptive to the scene as well, to the category. Um, we were bringing healthier snack into the masses, which was disruptive also, um, because at the time people were saying, you know, I was told on numerous occasions, nobody wants healthy snacks. People want so sugar, they want salt, they want fat. And I'm like, no, they don't, you know, we need to get into the healthy snacking and, and, and drag people up to that. So, so in a disruptive manner, kind of like create, you know, not creating, but really bringing something to the category, um, and then the guerrilla marketing actions, which brought us onto the, the platform a lot so what, 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 what techniques and what tools did you say you used? Was it, did you use social media? Was it, was it done like that? Or, or, or what else did you do? So it was social media and it was at festivals um, and um, festivals and market stalls and things like that. That is how we got the message out there. So, yeah, so to, in terms of the, the pitch with Chris Evans, that was a really good guerrilla move because then my local press put that on the front page of the local paper and then it went into different papers and all, all around the country. We got in the Independent, the, uh, the Mail and different places like that. And when that. you saw that, was there a spike afterwards of interest? Yes. I mean, once you, once you hit that, w would you say that that was that lucky move, that was the, the piece of luck that, that, that changed it from being a, a, a small kitchen-based business into something a bit It bigger. really did put us on the map. So that put us on the map, winning the Theo Pafitas SBS, which is a tweet that you send to Theo on a Sunday evening. That helped put us on the map. Mm. Um, winning a Great Taste Award and being shortlisted for other awards helped put us on the map. We also won an award for the brand, which was Cool Brand Award. So when you combine all that together, it was like the perfect storm of um, positive disruptive. Over what period of time is all that going all on? All that happened within the first year, which is why that chapter and book is called um, Buckle Up, You're About to Go Warp Speed, because that's literally what it felt like. Because there are a lot of businesses out there that will languish, won't they, in the slow lane for years and years and years and years, and maybe then overnight it will happen, and then they're perceived as being overnight successes mm -hmm. when they've got maybe 10 years of hard work behind yeah. it to actually get to that particular point. But but different for you, then? I think it all depends on, on, on you as a person and your business. So we, to a degree, we had to go as fast as that because we'd launched essentially with not enough cash. You know, we'd... we'd to get the funding, we'd um, cut back and cut back and come back on what we thought we would need. And, and really, in hindsight, we, we were underfunded from launching. Um, so we had no option other than to go at it full pelt. So the first lesson then would be, you know, use social media, make a noise. Do you think having awards around you, because a lot of the awards that you see are actually just vehicles for the, the yep. award organisers mm -hmm. to generate income for themselves. But, but, you know, sometimes those awards are good for you. Definitely in the food world, you know, we won the Great Taste Award and that line, we watch, we won the award for was always our bestseller. And, you know, we would see, we did see a spike in the sales. Whenever you do get any publicity about it or if any of the newspapers publish the fact that you are an award winner with the Great Taste Award, the Free From Awards. I mean, currently I judge on the Quality Food Awards, the Great Taste Awards and the Nourish Food Awards. And I know that when, you know, any of my clients have won any of these awards, the feedback they give me. So I know firsthand, but I also know um, from what it does to, to clients' businesses. Yes, yeah, so definitely in the food world. But I think in any, do you know, any, any, if you're award winning, um, it kind of says something. You've got the, the, the backing We've of the We've people. actually done a program on, on this. Do, do awards work for business? I and, think and, they do, 100%. And they do, mm. categorically. Okay, you keep mentioning there that you launched with not enough funding. Yeah. That must have been a bit of a worry then. So were you always looking over the edge of the cliff then? Oh, absolutely. Dangling. <laughs> no, dangling by dangling your fingertips. Dangling from the edge of the cliff, yeah. And, and, and I suppose another question is, what is enough money? I mean, how, how do you know? What was it that you, what were you paying for? What was the money for? What was the investment going to be for? So we, we had quite high production costs. Because um, of the, the production method we chose to achieve the healthier credentials, our factory for the manufacturer was over in Holland. So we obviously had the euro to contend with as well as the, the high manufacturing costs anyway. Uh, then in we... those days, of course, it was worth something, wasn't it, being <laughs> trading in pounds <laughs> as opposed to one to one these days. But yes, go on. Um, and then obviously the, the marketing aspect of it all, uh, packaging origination when you're, when you're talking um, in, in these 
in the retail world, you know, your minimum print runs could be quite large. So, you know, our packaging to get started was around about ten thousand pound. I think it was seventh of packaging, and then the rest was on the plates, originations, and things like that. So you've got some quite high startup costs that you just can't can't dodge. You know, depending mm -hmm. on what 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 product and what. So you're where launching. did you go to get the money then? How did what 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 was your approach to do that? So our first lo our first startup cash, which was a loan, was from our local chamber. Um, and then after that, we, Chamber of Commerce. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we took we we went and networked out. Which again, don't overlook networking. That is one of your main sources of growing your business, whether that's for raising finance or spreading the word or anything. Can I ask how much you were looking for? Is that allowed, or you can tell me to buy my own business? Yeah, no, no, that's fine. So if we'd have wanted to um, install a vacuum frying factory into the into the UK, Sounds two very million, glamorous, isn't it? yes. <laughs> So that was no no go. So then we looked at see if we could install a batch fryer, which would have been a smaller um, version of that to, to try and keep the manufacturing in house. Um, I can't remember the figures around that, but we were still looking at in excess of you know hundred thousand, two hundred thousand something. Um, so we eventually got launched with a fifty thousand pound loan um, by putting the manufacturing overseas. Um, but it really, it, you know, it wasn't it wasn't enough. But we cut it back and cut it back, really, to get the to get the dream going. Do you know, mm -hmm. you, you do what you need to do to get it off the starting blocks. And when you were going along to potential investors, what mm -hmm. what kind of reaction were you getting from them at the time? And and how do you prepare yourself for that? If someone's looking to raise money for their business, mm -hmm. what do you do to prepare for that? Right. Okay. So there's a whole section in my book about that. Um, you know, you're going to have to get this book up. There's no two ways <laughs> about it. You, you've got to get the book. Yeah. But go on. Yes. There's a whole section um, of the book. So it's so it's really about knowing your business and knowing when you're going to. So I get clients contacting me now and they're saying you know we we know that we're going to need money and I, I i say right okay when do you think you're going to need it what are you going to need it for and how much you're going to need and in what context do you want that money so do you want somebody on board who is going to be involved in the business or do you just want to let's say fund via crowdcube or anything similar like that and just get the cash on board and then not ha not have shareholders really involved in your business so it all depends on your business what you want them to achieve and when when the deadline is really we sometimes watch dragons den and of course they always push a little bit for a little bit more and i think they on tv it's an entertainment program and they come over because that's the entertainment that that the tension the jeopardy that is taking place within the program Do, is the meetings with investors like that um, well, so I did Dragon's Den four years ago now, and that that was um, you know an experience all of its own. So we went on and pitched for seventy five thousand, mm -hmm. and in return we were going to offer well we were offering fifteen percent, and Duncan Ballantyne came straight in with his offer um, for half the money and for half the equity. And at the time, Peter Jones was nearly, you know, he was teetering on the edge. And I remember one conversation; it was between Duncan and, and Peter, and they were saying. So who's going to do the work in this business? And and I chirped up and said, I'll do all the work. You know, just just let's let's get over, let's get invested. Uh, but anyway, Peter Jones walked away um, just at the final. He said, I'm sorry, I can't. He was torn between his head and his heart because we already had loans in the business by this stage of the private um, investors. So he walked away. So in terms of anything pitching for any money beyond being in the den was um, less stressful because I don't think anything is as stressful as pitching for money as when you pitch into the dragons. Um, but no, we, we came out of that intact and then went on to, to raise funding. Right, but that. just before we have a, a little short break, a bit of an inside track, is it is it really the way we see it on TV or is it can it be a bit more friendly? As long as you go in there knowing your numbers, will you be all right? I think if you know your numbers inside out, you'll be absolutely fine. But you know what I'm going to say? There's a whole chapter about dragons den in my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, boy, it, telling people how to prepare. Uh, I tell you what, if you're, if you're wondering what book she's talking about, she's talking about this one here. Now, how to prepare for that? But surely, I mean, once again, I mean, we, we, um, uh, Linda and myself, we went looking for investment in a project that we were working on that actually developed into another channel. Mm -hmm. And the thing at the time was we were looking for five million pounds, mm -hmm. and on reflection, I think we should have been looking for ten million pounds because I think ten million actually would have been easier to get than five which would have been easier to get than 50,000 mm -hmm. and I think sometimes it's a different scale of things isn't it depending on what you're trying to achieve yeah. isn't it yeah. all right listen more from you in just a few moments okay. time hope you're enjoying today's show Claire Brumby uh, is a coach mental speaker and consultant and she's the guest on today's program hope you're enjoying the program up here on business connections live 
All right, let's go back, get some more good advice for you on this particular show. Uh, show. How to be an expert in your industry. Uh, broadcast the 5th of March on this edition of Business Connections Live. Uh, I was talking to Emma Taring and Eve Hutchinson from the Marketing Matrix uh, about how to be an expert in your industry. It's very important and it does position you. And it's interesting, I suppose what we're doing here is that uh, Claire is our, our expert today just by sitting here. A real, real good programme actually. And uh, a lot of people I think sometimes don't realise that they should actually position themselves within the industry because then it becomes an aid to the marketing of the business itself. Uh, so it was Emma Taring and Aneve Hutchison. We hear from Aneve first of all. Uh, this happened and some good advice on Business Connections Live. Hi, I'm Aneve Hutchinson um, from The Marketing Matrix and we've been talking today about how to position yourself as an expert in your industry. And there are six, five or six key ways to do that, particularly on your website. The first being writing in a way that shows that you understand your client's pain points and the challenges they're, they're facing and that the solutions that you can provide to help them with that. The second one being to include lots of reviews and testimonials from happy clients with them explaining exactly how you've helped them. Um, also case studies, well written case studies that describe the problem, the solution and the outcome will be really helpful as will a valuable free offer which people will be able to take advantage of in exchange for an email address. Finally, an introductory product that makes it really easy to buy your services will help you out, as will including a very clear call to action so you're telling people exactly what to do next. Emma Taring from The Marketing Matrix. I think to, to just sum up what Aneve said, uh, people, people worry very much about bombarding people. You don't want to absolutely bombard people with too much information. But on the other hand, we're all busy, we all miss things. So you have to think about, we talk about touch points in marketing, bit of a jargony word, but that quite often you'll have several experiences or you'll get to know about a company in lots of different ways before you make a buying decision. So don't be nervous that just because you've emailed them doesn't mean you can't put something out on social media that they might see as well. Doesn't mean that you can't talk about it network event the same people might be present at you know just as long as that consistency is there that you're saying the same type of thing you're being very consistent in what you say that that's that's what's going to build that relationship and build that trust and, and they'll want to then do business with you Emma. Aneve and uh, Emma there on Business Connections Live. If you want to watch the entire programme, then I suggest you go along to our website at businessconnectionslive.com. Really good show. I uh, saw them the, the other Friday, actually, at a BNI. Now, I'm not a big, I'm going to say this, maybe I shouldn't, I don't know. People will beat me up. I'm not, I'm not a huge BNI fan because I think, you know, different. Um, networking organizations are specific for particular organizations but i tell you what i went to uh, the launch of a brand new one it was down in uh, weybridge they're actually starting up a new chapter there and i actually thought do you know a good bunch of people uh, really really keen to get going good cross-section i think sometimes with some of the different networking events i didn't feel anybody was selling to me and i think that was a nice thing we were everybody was interested in what everybody else was doing and taking things on board and then going off and going, you know, actually, there are people that I think I can introduce you to. And isn't that what networking is all about? And sometimes with some of these formalized organizations, uh, you, you can get maybe hooked into a bit of a trap. And what happens is the networking organization itself, all it's doing is promoting itself and gaining uh, funds and money for itself. Maybe another program, maybe another program, I don't know. You're watching Business Connections Live. My guest today is Claire Brumby. She's a coach, mentor, speaker, and uh, consultant. Listen, as you've gone as you've gone through all of this, and you've been you've been growing the business. So we we did the guerrilla marketing. Mm -hmm. We we've gone for the fu funding. Yep. But of course, you know, at the whole start of this, you know, we had this this worry about your health. Mm -hmm. You've gone through all of this now. Yep. So it can't be just plain sailing from there on, can it? I mean, were there issues, were there problems in hindsight that you look back on and go, if only I'd done it a little bit different. And, and I know if only is, a, you yeah. know, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Yeah. But were there knockbacks for you that you actually learned from? Yeah, all along the way. And, and you know, that's I do have that bit, what will Claire do now in my book? So um, I have like... Have you got a book, by the way? <laughs> 
<laughs> that, that actually wasn't a plug. You, you've turned it into a plug, but yes, I do. But by the way, there's a book, just in case, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so, so what would... So, so yeah, and do you know what? Sometimes I wouldn't have done anything any different, and that's back to that entrepreneurial drive and who you are. Do you know, if it's in your DNA, it's in your DNA, and no matter what you tell yourself, you would have done different. If you're really truthful with yourself, you perhaps wouldn't have done. But, yeah, so I've had... You know, there was quite a lot of knockbacks along the way. Um, knockbacks with funding. Um, in the very early days, knockback with the brand name. You know, somebody else oh, Yes, had now, that's an interesting name. story. This, now, this is, he says, not trying to plug the book, but this is in the book. <laughs> this is a story. You were sitting down watching TV, weren't yes. you? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had... Uh, um, originally, we were called another brand name, and it was a Sunday evening, and I was watching TV, and there was a programme called High Street Dreams with a lady called Jo Malone, um, you know, the... the, the entrepreneur and she was there coaching some new entrepreneurs onto their new brands and um, new businesses and lo and behold on the TV there was a couple and they were essentially using using the name that we'd already trademarked and used. Um, Did you sleep that night? No I was absolutely like what do I do about this you know how do I fight it what do I do with it you know do I give up with it all these things going around in my brain um, and then as luck would have it you know in the coming days I was at a networking event um, and Tim Campbell was there the first um, apprentice. apprentice winner mm -hmm. yeah and he was in a room and he was saying to anybody does anybody have any questions and nobody else put their hand up and spoke and I just asked him um, if he knew of any sort of like no win no fee IP lawyers who could perhaps help me with this wrangle that I've got on with my trademarking and he just gave me a number to call um, of some solicitors that you know he, he worked with absolutely free of charge for me to get this information so we, we fought it that way we but the, the in actual fact the fight was us then walking away and saying do you know what we'll just invent another name so that was a knockback you know but how do you arrive at those decisions mm. how do you think okay you know and, 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 he and, what, liked... and what's the lesson there I mean when you researched the name originally the, the name of the business was Muddy Boot Muddy boot. Yeah, and, muddy and, boot foods, yeah. And, and when you arrived at that, you must have done your research on it as well, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, they, so we were thinking of what to call. So originally we were going to call the crisps muddy boot roots, as in they were root vegetables, and, you know, that, that fitted perfectly. And at the time there was nothing there uh, on, on the IP uh, trademarking. You know, we, were, we had absolute free reign to use that name. Um, because people get confused, don't they, between what you call your business company name and, and what you call your name. trademark yes. and your brand yeah, name and yeah, all the rest yeah. of it. So can you just define that for us so yeah, we, we so, get it? So essentially at Company's House, you incorporate your business and you call it you know, whatever you want to call it, providing the business name is available. In terms of what you call your brand and what you trade as, if you want to trademark it, then you go uh, and look at the IPO .gov.uk trademark it. And we're saying, and the IPO is intellectual property... Um, I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, but, but yeah, that's yeah, what we're talking about. It's yeah, intellectual yeah, yeah. property. I'm sure someone will tell me in a minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that's where you go and, and you, you do your research. Or, you you know, you can get an, um, a trademark and attorney to do all this for you. Um, but anyway, so we ended up walking away from that. So that was one thing that was... That you know, potentially could have cost you a lot of money, couldn't it? That could have actually brought the brand down, couldn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, luckily we'd not got the funding on the actual... We'd been sort of like trading from the market stall for a few years with that name. So, uh, yeah, we'd, we'd incorporated... Sorry, we'd, we'd trademarked, so we'd lost that money. Um, but actually, Tim, in his talk, he was saying, sometimes you have to understand when you're that fly against the window, you know, bang, 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 and do you just sort of fly away <laughs> you know at what time at what point with any challenge you face do you say enough's enough or do you fight through it and with, it, with every setback that you get on your journey be it food or otherwise you have to say when's the time to just walk away from this one so you, you've sorted out the production of it you sorted yep. out your brand name um, mm -hmm. you've got the intellectual copyright on that now your intellectual property on yep. that um, you're you're beginning to to market the product I take it into supermarkets yep. which is a good move at that stage, as an entrepreneur, are you thinking about exit plans? Um, that's, or are you still just, was, are you working in it or on it? I business? was still in it and just still at the point of staying alive um, because, you know, we still needed to get high volume. And I think one mistake that we made as well was we, we jumped, but we had to for cash flow purposes. So we were like pushing, pushing for the big listing, which is what I talk to my clients about all the time now. You... My brain was just purely that it was it was on the route where we had to get the big listing. I didn't look at any other routes to market. Yes, we were trading on the when market. When you say the big stores. listing, you mean um, with Waitrose? You know, so, so, it so, be a bit, so a big client, a yeah, big retailer. Yeah, yeah. Sainsbury's, Waitrose, any, any of the big four or five. Um, 
So Which one came in first? Waitrose for us. And the moment, and of course, uh, uh, you know, they're premium food, aren't they? Uh -huh. So that's what they're talking about, premier food. And I suppose when you're, when you're talking to them, once that happens, do the others come in? Do they follow like sheep? They don't, not without hard work, you still have to um, sort of like pitch to them and it's, you know, and, and the buyers move on and the buyers change, so I represent quite a few of my clients now going into pitching to buyers and it can take so long because the buyers move on and they go for category reviews and they change, you know, so much within their, within the, the sector, so, you know, it doesn't necessarily flow that, oh, I've got that one now, so this will flow and actually it takes, you know, what I would say is as well is it takes a lot more money than you think it's going to take and it takes far longer than you think it's going to take. So you've got two two variables there that you're not actually sometimes prepared for or a lot of my clients aren't prepared for. I think it's going to happen faster. It, and what about the pitch itself when you're standing there? We, we sometimes see some dreadful pictures on the TV, but is there any advice you would give to people? Because everybody, I suppose, who's got a product, we're forever pitching, aren't we? Everybody mm -hmm. is pitching somewhere or other. Do, yeah. you, do you have any advice on, on the most effective format to pitch in? Yeah, well... Yeah, don't dare... Someone just said it, it's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I hear voices. Do you know what? I promise I, I won't say anything more about my book. Don't say any more um, about it. So, so, yeah, so I think first and foremost, know your commercials inside out um, and know why. So if we're talking from a bias perspective, why should they, essentially, to put your product on shelf, they've got to take somebody else's off. So... Um, you're smiling. What are you smiling at? No, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm okay. just smiling naturally. I'm just right, a happy, okay. happy go lucky um, kind of guy. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's essentially understanding. Um, why they're going to take somebody else's product off shelf and put yours on? So, you know, you've got to convince them. Um, you're going to extend the, the footfall in the category, or you're going to bring bring new people there, or you're going to increase sales for whatever reason. Um, the commercials have got to stack up their end from a from a buying perspective. I suppose the thing is, isn't it, that you've got to bring yourself out of your brand. It's when you look at websites and they go, we've been established for 20 years, we've got 300 vehicles, uh, we make 5,000 widgets, and actually mm -hmm. nobody's ever searched on any of those things. And I think sometimes you see when people are pitching, it's all about me, 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 yeah, and not yeah. what it means to you, 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 you. You've got to you, flip you, it you. the other way around. Yeah. So if you're pitching for investment, what's in it for the potential investor? Um, if you're pitching for retail space on a supermarket, market shelf you know why should that buyer list you and actually what, what what's in it for the consumer do you know what I mean why is your product so different that somebody walking down the supermarket is going to take that off shelf and, and buy it so you know what you've always got to think about it from the other way around really really interesting so there you are you you win Waitrose yep you're in at Waitrose are you sleeping at night at this stage no because that was just pre Dragon's Den um, and we still needed to get the investment. So it, it's it, that, and do you know so what? So is that, is that something then that an entrepreneur, entrepreneur needs to be aware of is that, that you are, are you a risk taker? Absolutely, but only in a measured way. I think you have to know the risks, but understand yourself. It's all about yourself. It's all about understanding yourself. It, it's knowing, um, you know, what the risks are, knowing the worst case scenario and, and understanding, you know, are you up for that or not? Which, which again, you have to know yourself. You know what, what, what are you willing to risk? What are you willing to give? What, what are you, are you willing to give? What it takes, and that's all about understanding and knowing yourself. There's been more from Claire in just a few moments. How we are running out of time. This, I, I get the funny feeling. This is nearly a two-parter, isn't it? We could get Claire here next week as well. She could do another hour, actually. Uh, I mean, it's been, it's been really, really interesting. Claire Brumby, she's a coach, mentor, speaker, and consultant. And we're talking about how she grew a business. She keeps alluding to a particular book. We'll come to that in just a moment. If you want to find out more about uh, Claire, you can go to clairebrumby.com. Uh, here's her website. It's a cracking website. Uh, the food guide, helping a guy in your food business to grow. I think what's interesting about all of this is that actually it isn't just about food business. I think it's giving you ideas, inspiration, it's giving you the encouragement that you need to move forward. If you are thinking about starting a business, regardless of what market sector you find yourself in, I think this particular page, book, blog, service, all the things that Claire does could be a real insight, a real help for you as well if you want to grow your business and make it a success. So Claire Brumby, more from her in just a moment on this edition of Business Connections Live.
Well, it's lovely to have your company as always. We're live here on a Monday. Thank you very much. If you're watching us on Facebook, do press those hearts. We'd like a little bit of uh, love right now. I realised the other week that we weren't doing as much on uh, Periscope or or Twitter as I thought we were doing when it comes to the live programs. But luckily this week we're all back there and everything is working fine. If you're watching on Facebook, please do leave a comment. And just because maybe you're watching the promo on repeat or catch up or whatever on the website, uh, if you do have a comment about the promo, or there's a question perhaps you'd like to have asked, uh, then please do put it there and we will actually get back to you as well. So please do get involved with us here at Business Connections Live. Also, if you want to bring the program with you, and it's quite interesting, there's a whole number of different platforms out there uh, Stitcher, for instance, is the big podcasting platform, but the Stitcher, the Spotify, which we're, we're on now, there's um, oh, uh, Blueberry, uh, there's Roku, and of course there's also iTunes as well. Thousands of you on a weekly basis are downloading the program on iTunes. For that, we say thank you very much indeed. Don't forget, do leave a, a glowing review if you don't mind. It's dead easy to do. Uh, just uh, go into your account, view the program in iTunes, and then it'll take you to this. You'll see a tab saying ratings and reviews. Click on that tab and then it takes you to the page where you can say, Steve Harlan, he's just an old fella, but um, Claire Brumby was absolutely fantastic and learned so much from her. Uh, just write a review, give it five stars, and that really help us. And then what will happen is that the algorithm within iTunes will recommend the program to other people who are watching similar business programs and the audience will grow. But seriously, thousands of you downloading, thousands of you are watching, and for that, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed. You're watching Business Connections Live. My guest today show, Claire Brumby. She's a coach, mentor, speaker, and consultant. We're talking about growing your business. She is the author of the book. <laughs> not that you'd know. She's barely mentioned it. Uh, <laughs> the Winning Mix. It is a really, really good book. There's no two ways about it. Um, even if you're just looking for something that is a reference book. Inside the book, and I think this is a really good idea, she's got Claire's Diamonds. Now, you sometimes see this. Claire's Diamonds. I'll read that one to you. It is, um, it's no good waiting until you have this and that. If you wait, you'll never get off the block. Start now, start today. And what you do, uh, what, what you do have, otherwise you'll wait forever. Kind of ruined it the way I read it. But it is full of these little nuggets, these little diamonds of advice that you can apply to your business. And, and I, I think in many respects, looking at the book, because you're, it is all about you launching your business and what you learned. Mm -hmm. that, that nearly there's a feel that would I pick that book up if I was if I wasn't launching a food business? And yet when I went through it, I realised that everything that is written in here applies to every business. And yeah. I think you know you, you just open it on any page here. What are your manufacturing costs per unit? What's the wholesale price per unit? Retail price, turnover to date, gross profit, net profit, forecasts of gross. Uh, how much would you like to pitch for? How would you do, what would you do with the investment if you secured it? It is generic advice for yeah. any entrepreneur who is mm -hmm. starting their business. Absolutely. All right, let's get back to your business. So we've got a long way. You've got Waitrose now and they're, they're supporting you. Were there any tips when it came to how you used the money, you know, saving the money, using your time? Were there things, because you said you're not sleeping because you had The Apprentice coming up, there must have been a time you actually started sleeping again. I think I started sleeping again once we'd made the decision to sell the brand. Um, because, so, so flash forward, we got some, so we launched into Waitrose, we were supposed to get 100 and something stores, we actually got 230, which was amazing, although that did bring its own pressures because obviously we had to ramp up production, which obviously cost more money, and Waitrose wanted more than just the, the one line that they'd originally said, they wanted another line, so that cost more money in terms of originating packaging. I think what I should have perhaps done is been strong on the ne negotiation side. Well, I was going to ask you about that, when you go in there, they're, they're looking for their margins, aren't they? So. Mm. Typically, for a, a supermarket like that, remember when you work in retail shop, uh, retail TV shopping, mm -hmm. uh, particularly on the infomercial channels, the markup is five times. I, I, I know maybe that's a secret. I don't know, but that's basically what it is. You know, yeah. buy in for a fiver, mm -hmm. sell it for twenty-five pounds, something yeah. like that. So essentially, supermarkets are looking for around forty percent, depending on what category you're in. So the forty percent wasn't the problem. What the problem we had was the uh, increased manufacturing 
capacity and also the and new cash flow. The, yeah, exactly the new line to originate which was the packaging the plates and the cash flow and the production so so that did you know although it was amazing and although it was the break that we'd been looking for so long to achieve which actually took 18 months to get to that point of, of, of winning uh, a retail a listing uh, it did bring extra pressures um, so then we went and we got some funding on board for some investors um, but was it getting easier now to get the funding um, yes, once we'd got the um, commitment from Waitrose and Acardo and we got other nice flagships under our belt, you know, Fortnum and Mason and Harrods and Partridges and quite a lot of nice high profile listings coming through and some big distributors as well. So wholesale and we've done some export. So yeah, all, all of that did make it better because obviously you're not as much of a risk in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, you are actually building up a market, you know, a, a following and you are building up some sales and you've got a good book of business coming through. So you're less of a risk in that respect, um, but yeah. So so we got the investment on board. We we um, we took some investors on, and they, you know the cash flow was there to start with and things. Um, but the dynamic in the business changed. It just wasn't fun anymore. And I think, you know, was that the decision? It was it was in the approach. Did somebody approach you to, to buy it, no, or did no. you decide to sell it? No, John and I just said, you know this doesn't feel the same as when it was just us being very entrepreneurial, dragging the kids around the country to festivals and markets and kind of like putting our own, I, I'm like we said, I'm very entrepreneurial and I don't work well when I can't express myself in that way. So um, I felt that I couldn't be of that kind of energy. So anymore. did you go out and look for a buyer at that point or, or what did you do? So we, t we went to our board of directors and we said look you know do John you and I it? want to sell and then so so it ended up being sold to a completely independent um, company in Wolverhampton called AIB Foods and now they're growing it and thriving it so yeah so I, I um, yeah I, I really I'm happy with the decision that we took. And of course you're enjoying what you're doing now. I love do you, what I do, do now. Do you think too many people put the badge on that says I'm an entrepreneur. It's a bit like if you go onto LinkedIn at the moment. Everybody is a best-selling <laughs> author, aren't they? Have you noticed that? Everybody is a best-selling author on LinkedIn. Best-selling author, uh, uh, international speaker. That's what you hear. Are you that? Uh, well, do you know what? I am a best-selling author. <laughs> <laughs> She's got a book, by the way. Uh, and, <laughs> and yes, I am an entrepreneur. I'm not international, not yet, so we'll see. But um, yeah, no, but you're right, you're right. Um, do you think people put the badge on they and do. They, they don't really know what the Well, what and the also, badge means. you know, where, where's the battle scars? Show me your battle scars. You know, how long were you at the coalface? Actually, you know, what, what have you done? And that's a lot of what my clients like about me. You know, they like the fact that I've, I've done it. You know, I am a mentor in the food industry for a reason because I've, I've done it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what they, they like about working with me. And that's what attracts people to work with me that, I, you know, I have done it. Well, you know, it's been, it's been a, a fascinating insight into, into what you do and what you've achieved. And it's okay. been really interesting sort of going all the way from the beginning. And I think what's been nice about the story as well that okay you had that that wake-up call at the very beginning yep. and it kind of sort of said what am I doing with my life mm -hmm. um, the, the 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 last question I suppose before we give this the summary the key takeaways to the viewers is that you, that was the wake-up call for your life but of course you've, you've got a private life you have got three children and, and yep. everything so for them as well I mean what were your thoughts about at that time I mean was it going to affect them or were you building a future for them what, in terms of selling the business? Well, the no, I, I felt right at the very beginning where you had that wake-up call. Yeah, OK, well, like I say, it was just about to, you know, to stay alive and, and do, you know, be a mum for the kids, you know, keep, keep on the planet and, and you know, be happy. Uh, you know. Are they very proud of you now? Because they must get it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do. Um, <laughs> they, they, yeah, they, they do. I mean, so, so my eldest, she's twenty. Lucy's twenty. Then Abigail's nearly eighteen, and Georgie's fourteen. So, and then they do get it. And actually, I'm going to speak in Georgie's school in his business studies class on Friday because uh, he's, you know, well, they all are very, very proud. But he wants me to go and speak to his his. Um, do they ever eat the product or are they all big burger fans? Do you know what? I, I, there was one point when our garage was absolutely full of vegetable crisps. It's all they lived on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. If you're hungry, go get, go get some crisps. Claire, thank you very much indeed for coming in today. It's been a real insight into it. If you do want to get hold of the book, then please, uh, where can I get the book? It's on Amazon. I it is on know. Amazon and I, I do say please, please order, even though it's showing um, out of stock at the moment. It's because it did sell so well. Um, it's taken a while, but um, you know, the more orders go on, the quicker it will speed up the... Um, 
the print process again so please do order it yes all right listen a fantastic book a very good read actually and it does apply it's not just about the food industry it is also uh, about any entrepreneurial endeavor that you may take up if you're trying to grow your business at the moment if you're looking for the trials and tribulations that you're going to find yourself going through then the book is going to be good advice it's a good read as well it gives you a bit of an insight into what claire is all about claire we always ask our guests at the end of every hour to look mm -hmm. straight down that nice camera over there where rolston is say who they are where they're from and also give us the key things that we should remember from the prem the key takeaways that will help us grow our business mm -hmm. and help us all to become a little bit more entrepreneurial and i suppose importantly more successful in our lives as well okay. the airways are all your straight down camera right, okay. number four take it away right okay so as you've already gleaned everybody my name is claire brumby and this is my book the winning mix so i'm an author a mentor and a speaker and consultant um, primarily to food businesses and i guess what i'd like to leave the viewers with today is um, just to say if you are looking at starting your food journey then you know do your research look into where you would actually pitch it in the category um, probably get in touch with me if you want a mentor to to help you along the way um, and, and i guess to anybody who is just you know stuck in that place of not knowing if they want to start a business or not um, if it's something you really really want to do and you've got that entrepreneurial drive I would say go for it and do it fantastic if you've got that entrepreneurial drive go and do it if you want to find out more about Claire you can go to the food guide Claire Brumby and uh, that is at clairebrumby.com uh, some good stuff there a little bit about Claire you can buy the book online there as well also the, the different things that she's offering organizations uh, mentoring for instance tasty bites services speaking events and things like that tasty bites I've got, I've got to click on that because that's just dragged me to it I've clicked on it and I'm waiting here we go uh, want a free taste on how to launch your food business what's that all about very quickly okay so if anybody wants just to, like it's a free free taster literally just subscribe onto there give me your email address you'll get a downloadable um, ebook all about how to launch a food business um, that should just give you just enough information to think okay um, is this is for, it me? Right for me yeah yeah <laughs> Once again, thank you very much to Claire Brumby. Hope you've enjoyed today's program. It's been a fascinating insight into the whole world of how to start not just a, a food business, but also uh, to start any business as far as I'm concerned. I found it really, really interesting and also quite inspiring as well today. So uh, my thanks once again to Claire. We've got some great programs coming up in the future as well. Susan Armstrong joins me next week. She's an international talent development expert, speaker and award-winning worldwide author. Uh, she's international too. She's just back from America, in fact. Timothy Cooper, our Business Development Director of the AA, is going to be joining me. And also Deborah Hume, our Minerva Engagement. She's an HR um, consultant, but more than that, she also does neuroscience too. And Louise Punter, uh, the CEO of the Surrey Chamber of Commerce. Interesting that uh, you said earlier on that the, the Chamber actually uh, were instrumental in mm -hmm. the very early part of the business. Definitely. So once again, that's why the Chambers are so important to any business, regardless of where you are in the UK. Listen. Thank you very much for watching the program today. I hope you got something out of it. I have found it really interesting. Uh, we're going to do it all again next week. Susan's going to be joining us on the program. But until we do it all again next week, take, have yourself a really good week. And uh, from Claire and myself, Steve Highland, we'll see you then. Bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>